convention and the vote yes unto campaign. Um, we're thrilled to have all of you here tonight and hope that you're all joining us in health and wellness. Um, what we're here to talk about tonight certainly directly impacts our health and well being as Missourians. And we have a great opportunity um, to improve our well being um, in the coming days. So, thank you to Healthcare for Missouri in particular um, for giving us the opportunity for tonight's conversation. I want to welcome Cecilia Belzer Patton, who's our the Inclusion and Equity Director for the campaign, and Michael Whittier, who's the Coalition's Director for the campaign. They both have been working tirelessly over the last month in particular, but before that as well, um, to turn out the vote and make sure we get this done next week. I think, what are we, four short days away? Um, for coming in on it, um, where we'll all have this opportunity. Tonight, you'll get to hear from our panelists um, who have a lot of firsthand experience with the Medicaid program from a variety of perspectives about how it impacts our health and well being. Um, we encourage you to ask questions as we go. There's a QA button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll work to get to all of your questions um, as the evening progresses. To get started, I really just wanted to start by telling you why Medicaid expansion is so important to us at Alive and Well Communities. Our board did vote to endorse um, this particular initiative um, because we know that without health care and when we are struggling accessing health care, that we are just perpetuating trauma and toxic stress. And that we know where states have expanded Medicaid that families are healthier physically, economically, and emotionally. And we know when we don't have health insurance, we're less likely to go to the doctor. We may not take our medications to stay healthy. And we know our communities, employers, and schools all suffer when our communities aren't healthy. And we know we're all living during a pandemic right now that's disproportionately hurting black and brown communities and we know that this is an issue of healthcare equity. And at the same time, not having access to healthcare is impacting all of our communities in Missouri. For our, from our perspective, a vote for yes on two really is a strategy to address the trauma and toxic stress that's making all of us sick. Um, for those who know us as an organization well, on the St. Louis side, uh, we came out of the St. Louis Regional Health Commission, and we saw firsthand in our work at the Health Commission working to improve access to care, that when people don't have access to care, it can devastate their lives. And we also know that when we do have access to health care, people can get back on their feet easily, get back to work, or stay in their jobs when otherwise they might not be able to. And you know for yourself, if you haven't had health insurance, how stressful it is knowing um, that you may not be able to see a doctor or worrying about taking your child to the emergency department because you don't know how you're going to pay that bill. And particularly if you're living with a chronic disease, what it can mean for your medication. And lastly, we also know this is good for our economy. Our tax dollars will stay in Missouri. We know healthcare jobs, particularly in rural Missouri, will be more secure and our workforce will be healthier overall, which just impacts productivity. So you're gonna hear um, from Cecilia and Michael tonight, but you're also gonna hear um, from those who are on the ground in our community. So I'm gonna introduce real quick our panelists. And so if you can um, turn your cameras on if they're not on. First, we have Sean Debria, who serves as the Policy and Advocacy Director for the St. Louis Regional Health Commission. Sean has more than 15 years of experience as an organizer and an advocate, a strategic planner, and a policy professional, and is super familiar with all the policies that govern Medicaid in Missouri today and with the opportunity that this presents with us. And then next is Shelly Lynn. Hi, Shelly. Um, Shelly's a mom and patient advocate in Kansas City. She serves on the advisory boards for Operation Breakthrough, and she's a member of the Alive and Well Health Leaders Work Group. And Lester Gillespie, I think Lester, I can see you. Lester is the founder and CEO of a nonprofit Fresh Start Self Improvement Center and the president of the NAACP in Charleston, Missouri, down in the boot heel. So Lester's going to talk with us tonight about Medicaid expansion and the impacts 
that has in rural Missouri. And then Jenny Armbruster is the Deputy Executive Director for NCADA in St. Louis. She oversees the counseling program, community prevention and education efforts, and knows directly the impact that healthcare access has on the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. And then we'll have another panelist join us um, just a little bit later, Nika Cotton, and she's the founder and owner of Soul Centricity in Kansas City. She's a poet, an advocate, a community organizer, and she knows firsthand the struggles of accessing healthcare as both a mom and a business owner. So before you hear from your panelists, I'm gonna turn it over to Cecilia, and she's gonna kick us off by telling us everything we need to know about Medicaid expansion, and then we'll hear a few things from our panelists. Oh, you know what, you all, Jennifer has such high hopes for me. That is wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for setting me up in that type of way. I appreciate you. Um, and I appreciate everyone that is here with us tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. We know that you do not have to spend your evening hour after work or doing whatever you want to do with us. And so we're grateful that you're here. And we appreciate you. We appreciate um, uh Shelly and Lester and Nika who have come to share their stories. We know how important the stories are that put a human face on what it is to be without health care or struggling in and out of health care in Missouri. We want you to know about Medicaid and Medicaid expansion and our Yes on Two um, campaign. Um, if you have any other questions, we really encourage everyone to go to yesonto.org. That is our website. We also are Yes on Two on Facebook and Yes on Two on Twitter. And so this can always give you information about um, the campaign on a minute to minute basis because everything is always changing, especially now as we are about four days and 16 hours away from the end of the vote. And so um, it has been a push. It has been a push for a lot longer than the year in which we've been really hearing about um, healthcare for Missouri and yes on two. Um, Michael and I were just on um, a, a, just a soul filling webinar with Medicaid 23, which were the 23 individuals that really have been on the ground since 2011, trying to get Medicaid expanded into our state. You all, there are 37 other states now who have expanded Medicaid. Um, and of those 37 states, obviously Missouri is not one. Um, people have been expanding Medicaid um, since 2010, um, 2011, when the Affordable Care Act came into play. And those efforts have been happening here on the ground in Missouri. And so those seeds that were planted by Medicaid 23, were, which was a coalition of 23 pastors and community leaders who took over the Missouri Senate to say that um, healthcare was a human right, um, that it increased our human dignity, that everyone should have it. Um, they went to jail for us, you all, and um, were convicted with trespassing um, and convicted in saying that peaceful protest didn't matter. And so we know that that is not true. We still believe that. And we know that there are other aspects and benefits of Medicaid expansion in our state. Benefits, as Jennifer was talking about, with the economic expansion of our state and um, knowing that in expanding Medicaid, we can ensure that rural hospitals and urban healthcare centers can remain open. Missouri, since 2014, has closed 15 rural hospitals and um, near as many of that healthcare sites and satellite sites in our urban core. And we believe that that is not something that has to happen. We believe that people deserve healthcare. We want to dispel myths about uh, Medicaid. Many people think that Medicaid is an extension of welfare. Medicaid is um, for working folks, is for folks who find themselves in, uninsured or underinsured, it's for people who are working hard every day, doing the type of jobs that we don't necessarily like to do, people who are taking care of our elderly and taking care of our early childhood um, infants and toddlers and um, daycare professionals. It is people that help to keep our buildings clean and help to keep us safe and healthy. It is people who um, work in the service industry as fast food workers. It's folks who manicure our lawns and make sure our cities and our towns look pretty. It is people that we go to church with. It's people in our families. It's people. And we are here to say that we believe that people deserve to not have to wonder if they have to make a choice between taking care of themselves and being healthy and paying for their rent. People should not have to make a choice between healthcare and their utilities. 
And people certainly should not have to make a choice between healthcare and the food that they put on their table. And so we want to do all that we can to, expel, to dispel any kind of myths around Medicaid expansion, to let everyone know what it is, um, there are things we will have to work out after we pass this on Tuesday to make sure everybody is getting the kind of care they deserve, and we will do that. Um, so we don't want to pretend like that there will still not be things that we will have to attend to um, come August 5th. However, we want to make sure that the nearly 300,000 people in Missouri who are uninsured have access to affordable health care because we all deserve it. And so uh, we want to open up to hear some stories, and we have um, folks on the line that re really can share. Um, I would like to start with Shelly, Shelly Lynn, who is here in Kansas City. And Shelly, can you please share your story about um, Medicaid and um, how you believe having good quality health care will help to, you know, how it makes a difference in one's life? Thank you for being here, Shelly. Uh, you're welcome. Um I just want to say that as um, I just started a new job, so I currently, if it wasn't for Medicaid, I wouldn't have insurance yet because you have to be on your job so many days to have insurance. Um, so with that being said, um, that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, I'm glad I haven't had to worry about like having the co-pays and then also paying for the insurance on top of my bills and rent and like food on the table or choosing between gas and... Uh or a bus, um, monthly bus path to get to work and get to these appointments and stuff like that. Um, also, having consistent care is huge. And with Medicaid, I've been able to do that. The doctors, they call me, they check on me, um, remind me of my appointments. Um, I don't have to worry about, oh, what did I say? Me and my daughter just recently recovered from COVID. So having that med Medicaid, was something that helped us get through that and if we had to go to the er when we, it was hurting to breathe we was able to go and i had to worry about oh we got a copay to pay so that's that was really helpful during that time and i got my results back today i'm negative so i'm happy about that <laughs> um so i'll be going back to work this weekend um i don't know so i guess just if there is emergencies i don't have to worry about me and my kids right now because we do have medicaid to get us through those times and it's just it's really huge and there's a lot of families out there that and it will help a lot more people during times of need so shelly thank you thank you no, you're welcome. You Thank you so much. You all, we're going to hear more from Shelly um, when we're doing Q&A from the panel. Shelly, thank you for having the vulnerability to share your story. We're so glad that you're well, you're healthy and that you're well and that you and your daughter are taken thank care you. of. Um, and super, thank super you. excited about your new job. So yay. Um, thank you. So yay, Lester, thank you. You're, <laughs> yes. you're welcome. Lester, can you share your story about why you believe that um, Medicaid will be is helpful for you. Well, you know, uh, I am a, a uh, I have a non for profit uh, organization called Fresh Start. We're having a hard time hearing you. Contact with and through our work at, at the agency. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, what I was saying was I have a non for profit and I have uh, our agency uh, uh, serves the entire spectrum of the community, whether it be the elderly, whether it be the youth, and whether it be uh, our, our older adults. And so in doing it, what I, what I see, the good thing about this is, is that and, and I'm claiming already that it's going to pass because I'm, I'm excited. I've been putting out signs, telling people he's uh, voting yes. And so what I see being a great benefit is, is that it's going to open up so many doors for uh, uh, hospitals to maybe start getting some real work out within satellite centers. Uh, within these small rural areas in this community. Uh, we had a hospital that, that the only OBGYN 
down in, in the southern boot hill, it closed. And so now some people got to drive 80 to 90 miles uh, uh, to go to, up to Cape Girardeau, Missouri to see OBGNY. So make sure that those services hopefully come back through this expansion. But the other part of it is, is that it's very important uh, as far as, uh, like for instance, diabetes. You know, when you, when you say you got pre-diabetes, you know, and if you catch that early enough, that's preventable. Diabetes can, can be preventable. If, if you catch it in the pre-diabetes stage, uh, you can do things like exercise, you know, make sure you eat it quickly. There is no one, there's not a lot of education going on in those areas. And so what happens is that when they're not educated on the subject, and then they get diabetes, then it's more of a worry because then they, they tell them all the harms of having diabetes, like uh, losing, losing your feet, your toes, your leg, and then people just get worried. And some people continue to go down that road because you don't have uh, access to, uh, to health care. Yes. Right. Thank you, and Lester. So, so, um, Lester also is going to be on the panel. And so, Lester, you are, so, are such a wealth of information. Thank you for sharing that about education. And we'll, you'll have some time on the panel to go into some other um, hey, issues that you would like to share with us. OK. OK, thank you. Nika, are you on? I don't think Nika is here yet. And so um, what I, I suggest that we do is to start with our questions and answer questions from the panel. And then when Nika gets on, she can join and Nika can share her story with us as well. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Sean. And I'd like for you as a healthcare professional, um, as a person who understands policy and all the stuff that often a lot of us don't understand, can you tell us about Medicaid and tell us about its intended purposes? Well, thank you for CLC and thank you for uh, Live and Will having me here. Um, I think you went through it beautifully at the beginning, uh, so I'll just kind of reiterate some of the points that you made. I think it's fitting that we're talking about Medicaid today uh, for a variety of reasons. One is the 55th anniversary of Medicaid uh, being implemented along with Medicare. And then also this was um, the day for uh, John Lewis's funeral. Uh, and it's really difficult to understand Medicaid, how it came about without understanding the stream of time in which it sprung up in, which was right in the middle of the civil rights movement. And so uh, Medicaid and Medicare probably would not be possible in terms of the scope of this influence if not for the, the, the civil rights movement. But Medicaid was always intended, and this is really important, especially when you begin to hear messages from the opposition, was always intended as a social insurance program for people who could not afford private insurance. Not simply for the vulnerable, quote unquote, not simply for the elderly, not simply for people with disabilities, but anyone who, is, uh, who could not afford um, insurance in the private market. So it's always been intended to be that safety net to give people healthcare access uh, regardless of their station uh, when they could not um, find coverage in the, in the private market. Um, and Thank so you for that. Thank you for that, Sean, because I think that's really important, right? And I think it's important to help people recognize that we shouldn't have to be arguing about who deserves it, right? That this is something that was intended for anyone who found themselves without health care to be able to access. And I, I think it's also important to understand um, that the moral basis of Medicaid is the fact that we as a society have made the decision that people should not go without, without healthcare access, simply because they don't have enough money to be able to afford private insurance. So oftentimes when Medicaid is talked about, it's talked about in the context of stigma, but no one that uses Medicaid should ever feel stigmatized because they're getting access uh, to healthcare through that program, because it was always intended for folks, working folks, people with disabilities that work or who don't work, elderly, et cetera. And another part, and then I'll, then I'll, um, I'll let you move on, 
uh, is the fact that Medicaid has always been a partnership between the federal government and state government. So for instance, Medicare is not a partnership. It is funded totally by the federal government. However, with Medicaid, you have partial, uh, a part of the program within the state funded by state dollars, and then also the federal government kicks in money. And not only with that funding arrangement, but also in terms of the way programming is developed, is very much catered towards the needs of the people within that state. So Medicaid is a partnership that has worked very well, uh, has been very robust, and after August 4th will be even more robust in Missouri. From your mouth to God's ears, to how, or however you conceptualize the divine or the universe, to wherever we need to make it happen. Absolutely, Sean. Thank you for that. And thank you for that um, fine tuning, because I have forgotten about the fact that this used to not be something that we stigmatized people with or made people feel bad about um, being able to have access to care. I think that's very important. Um, it is happy birthday to Medicaid and Medicare, um, July 30th, 1968. Um, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed uh, Medicare and Medicaid into law, um, into a bill and into a, a shared program for, um, for Medicaid, for states as well, as well as the federal government. And so these things that have been taken away from us, we in Missouri with gathering our 172,000 signatures that we needed, we gathered 300, over 350,000 that we have said we're gonna take this back into our own hands because our elected officials in Jeff City don't feel that we necessarily deserve this. And so we must prove them wrong. And we must remember from when we came, right? That this, did, this was a program that came out of the civil rights movement. It was a program and it is a program that is intended to be a safety net for people in times such as these, you all. Like when we're in times that are the coronavirus and COVID-19, where people are in a pandemic, no one should have to wonder, worry and wonder how they're going to take care of themselves and how they're going to be healthy. Imagine what Shelly's and her daughter's life may have been like testing positive for the coronavirus and not being able to have access to health care. No one deserves that not one single person. And so um, we're doing the things that we need to do in fighting the good fight um, to make sure that we vote yes on, two, um, on Tuesday. So I'd like to bring in Shelly and I'd like to, coming back to you, Shelly, I'd like to ask you, um, how, tell us how having healthcare gives you peace of mind as a single mom. Um, I don't know, as I said earlier, like just like during this pandemic and not, and just getting a job and not having insurance, it was helpful to have that Medicaid to rely on to even go get tested um, when I did get sick. Um, otherwise, it would have been, I don't know, I think I was told the COVID test, um, like for your second one is $150 if you have to go back to the same place twice. So I was glad there was other testing sites as well, like through KC Care and stuff that took my insurance to be able to take care of that because of Medicaid. I missed my toy box. Okay, go ask them. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be um, sorry. We love to hear the baby's voices. Don't be sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so with that being said, as a single parent, not having to worry about, like, as you said earlier, someone was talking about, like, the rent and the bills and having to pay that and then decide whether or not, um, like, as far as gas or paying for bus fare to even get to the appointment. Like, there's things like that that we have to even have to be able to even get to these appointments. And then you have to worry about, oh, I have a copay. Like, I gotta have that too. So that's just more on top of what you already have to have just to get to where you're going. So it gives me a peace of mind by just knowing I have that to rely on um, during times like this or when, you know, just getting a new job and not having the insurance and not having to worry about paying the insurance. Like this. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will. Just one moment. Sorry. Yeah. Apologize again. <laughs> he's being really, he's three, so he's like all over the place. Kids um, are on their own time, honey. It's, it's fun. And then also, like having a Medicaid, <laughs> having a um, Medicaid for like them, like the family Medicaid, that's real helpful because then your bill is like, even through insurance at work, your bill is still kind of higher than that family. So with the family Medicaid, that's helpful as well. So I think it'll be helpful for a lot of families. I know, thank you. 
So I don't know. I, I guess just as far as that goes, that's pretty much what I had to say. Just having that to rely on and peace of mind, and not have to worry about like our health and their health care and their vaccines and everything that comes when they get sick. Like when you have young ones, you know they think get sick more often. And thank God, you know my kids haven't, but my younger ones anyway. <laughs> thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So I'd like to bring in Jenny. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. I was happy to hear that you and Sean were going to be able to um, join us today. So we're thankful for that. Um, I'd like for you to uh, talk about, Jenny, how do you expect Medicaid expansion to help with both prevention and treatment of sub substance use disorders um, for our uh, citizens here in Missouri? Yeah, I'm happy to be here this evening. Thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, I think this is such an important issue and topic, uh, and I think the more we can keep talking and sharing information, hopefully we can see the difference made on Tuesday. We will do this. So, um, yeah, so at NCDA, we are a nonprofit that does both substance use referrals for treatment, so we don't, we're not a treatment agency ourselves, but, and then we also do a lot of prevention work. And on both sides of this, you know, we have uh, counselors that work that answer the phone from individuals and family members who are calling and are, are struggling to find substance use treatment. And both substance use treatment and other behavioral health services, we know that that, that window of, of want, that window of, of saying, I need help, and I, I want it now, can often be closed pretty fast. And so it's difficult when because of barriers with, with coverage that we can't give people treatment for substance use when they're ready to access it. And so, you know, looking at the numbers and these are available on the Yes for Two website and in other places, you know, rough probably, I would guess, low estimates is that people with serious mental health illnesses, including substance use disorder, make up about 28 to 30% of those who will be eligible with Medicaid expansion. So we're talking at least 65,000 people who now will be able to find treatment when, they, when they're ready and they want it. And this includes both, you know, treatment as people might understand it as counseling or other other support services, but then also their medication. We know that there's been advances in the addiction studies field to allow medications and other really great tools and techniques that people can can really get help when, when they're suffering. And so I think that's so important. As a prevention agency, you know, a lot of our prevention work is in primary prevention or prevention with young people. And, and although, you know, this particular Medicaid expansion won't directly provide services to the young people, we also know that, that when we're talking about substance use and we're talking about risk of substance use, it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't exist in isolation. And so when people are not able to receive care for a physical condition or another mental health disorder, substances are often used for self-medication because people are hurting and they wanna feel better. And initially substances sometimes is that path for people. And so by providing more care, by by, again, being able to have people access both physical health care, mental health care, other behavioral health services, we can reduce some of the stress and we can, we can help build some of those coping skills that, that ultimately will help reduce the need to turn to substances. And so when we're thinking about prevention, you know, we got to think about the long game here too, and that it's not just what can help immediately people right away, but as we go one, five, 10 years down the road, how that comprehensive care can really help the entire community in our, in our state. Yep, it's a process, right? And that mm -hmm. um, one, um, like Sean talked about, taking destigmatizing um, the need for healthcare, also destigmatizing um, substance use and addiction, and recognizing that, um, like you say, people oftentimes it's self medication and they are, there is in works in partnership with needing help in other areas of their life. So thank you for the work that you do and thank you for shedding light on that. And so that we can stop making people feel bad about themselves and hopefully Medicaid will be a step in them being able to get the help um, that they need and deserve. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, Jenny. So Lester, can yes. I ask you another question? Yes. 
Okay, you sound better now. So yay. Okay, <laughs> it was great. Right. It was rough there for a minute, Lester. Okay, um, can you tell us um, what impact you expect Medicaid expansion to have in rural Missouri? Well, I mean, I just see the importance of uh, everybody not only getting behind this, but and supporting it, but also, uh, you know, the education piece of it. And so, I believe once people get educated on their options as far as healthcare is concerned, access to healthcare, uh, prevention programs. It's in a in a rural area that's going to be powerful because they, uh, in, you know, in in the Boot Hill, we miss out on so much because of course we're not an urban area because we're a real rural, and so we don't we don't get the information uh, that we need as far as like what all does it cover. Uh, what what all does it uh, entails, and so I just think it's going to be uh, it's going to be like a breath of fresh air for the rural areas because now they're going to be able to get uh, some quality service and be able to get uh, their needs met as well as feeling good about themselves because when you feel good and you and and you got access to healthcare, you tend to not only feel good about your health but you feel good about your your person, who you are. And so I just think it's going to have a, a, a everlasting impact. And so we're just ready for it because I see so many people suffer because they don't have, they don't have Medicaid. And uh, I just think it's going to be, make a big, big difference in our area. I think so too, Lester. I think you, you hit on something really important when um, you talked about that it's not only going to help us with health care, it's going to help with the whole person, right? Um, I know as a veteran educator, when I could see a family um, was doing better, their child did better in school. Their child's um, grades were more stable. Their child's attitude was better. Their mental health was better. And so ways in which um, Medicaid can not only help people be more healthy and well, but also help people to be more engaged in their life in, in their town, possibly in their state, um, you know, and I don't think that we think about those overarching things that can happen. So thank you for bringing that up, Lester. I really appreciate that. Um, Nika, are you here? Oh, I don't think Nika's here. Um, Nika has a fabulous story and I, I, I can share some of this because we've been speaking about how important um, Medicaid is for entrepreneurs in our community, for people who have to work for themselves, for people who are in between jobs and doing different ways of working. It allows them to at least feel safe around their health. And so um, uh, Nika was going to speak about that, how um, when she first started her business a couple of years ago, um, how she did not have um, access to health care and how scary that was for her and how um, a recent illness has helped her to realize that being able to be on the front of getting some preventative care and catching things early has really helped in her health. And so um, these things are important. We would like to open up for questions in case anyone has any questions. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and so in any kind of way we can move forward with that. Do we have any questions yet? Let's look. Cecilia, do you want me to read them to you? Would that be sure. here? That'll be fine. What should we expect when Amendment 2 is passed? Will Medicaid expand immediately or will there be a process? How can we stay updated on next steps? Thank you for that question. So whenever um, we, when we pass this on Tuesday, it will then, there's a process time and then it will go into um, effect. Um, generally, like in November when we, Nika's here, so Nika can speak in just a minute. Um, I just saw that she joined. So um, when we, just like when we vote in another president in November, that president doesn't actually become president until January, there will be a process time for um, Medicaid expansion. And so that estimated time is about 30 to 60 days. And so it will be expanded into 
um, our state in 2020. It just won't be August 5th, right? It'll happen um, in a process from that time. But we will be able to move forward and to um, recognize that people will be able to have um, affordable health care. You know, people don't recognize that even though we have not expanded Medicaid, it has still been coming out of our taxes, it's still been coming out of um, the ways in which we are in relationship with the federal government. And so we lose over a billion dollars every year to um, our Medicaid not being used. And I hope that we don't think that that's just sitting around somewhere waiting for us to use it. What happens is the other 36, 37 states that have expanded Medicaid use it in their state, right? And so we know that this is going to be coming, coming to us um, as soon as possible after August 4th when we vote yes on two and we win this. Thank you for that question, Jennifer. May I add a couple of more details, Cecilia? Please, Sean, you're probably better at that than I am. Yes, please. No, you, you, did, a very, <laughs> you did a very good job. Um, so one thing to bear in mind is that when the ballot initiative was first crafted, we expected for this vote to happen in November. Yes. Um, and so we, we anticipated a very aggressive kind of timeline. And, and that timeline is included in the ballot language. Remember, it's a constitutional amendment. And so um, it, it directs the state and the government to operate in a certain way related to Medicaid expansion. And so March the 1st is when the state, ha after it passes, and again, this was supposed to, that we anticipated first on uh, to pass in November, um, but now since we'll be passing in August, there will be a little bit of an extended time. Um, but um, the state has until March the 1st to apply for whatever waivers that are necessary in order uh, to be able to draw down funds, to be able to accommodate the new responsibilities of the state. With Jan I'm sorry, July 1st, 2021, um, being the time when Medicaid has to be expanded. Um, so that's my understanding of kind of the timeline. Um, and one thing I would add, don't want to add any complication to it, but it kind of goes to another aspect of the question. Once this passes, we'll still have to be very vigilant. And so um, there may be a variety of, of areas where you know, we can get information and maybe there's something else that needs to be created, um, but we'll still need to be very vigilant to make sure that the expansion happens in a timely and orderly fashion. Um, and so we'll still need uh, you and others to stay fully engaged um, um, after it passes, but that's kind of the rough timeline that I understand. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sean. I didn't know if it shifted um, once since we have shifted to August, if that also shifted that. So that's great information to have. Um, I do want to highlight what Sean said about us having to be vigilant. You know, um, Frederick Douglass said that power never concedes um, itself without demand. And we must demand what we know will be beneficial to those in our state. And so it means that we're going to have to be on top of this even after we pass it that we are going to have to help do the things that we need to do in order for us to have a compassionate state that helps to take care of um, those that are considered um, some of the least of us. And so we will do that. Thank you, Sean. Any other questions, Jennifer? I don't have any at this time, but I do see that Nika joined us. Yep. So Nika, we would love for you to um, share your story and um, to tell us as a business owner and entrepreneur, how do you see Medicaid expansion helping you and your community? Yeah, definitely. It would be so great to be able to um, have some health care while I start my business. I'm um, doing my business full time right now. I don't have time to get a job so that I can have health insurance. Um, and so the options are either going to the marketplace, which I can't afford right now, um, or nothing. Um, so it would be nice to have another option on the table to be able to access, especially since I've in the past had some health issues that um, kind of came up out of the blue. Uh, my iron was, was really, really low. Um, went to the doctor because I thought I was depressed. I was sleeping all of the time and it turns out that I just had really severely low iron um, and it, you know, probably been over the course of at least six months um, that this had happened. It takes a long time um, for your iron to get to like that threshold. 
um, where mine was, um, it was a point that I needed an uh, iron infusion. Um, and so it's just a really scary situation that we're in. We have to negotiate or make decisions about our health care um, when we don't have money and we don't have health insurance. And we're not as likely to go to the doctor and to catch things that we could catch earlier when we don't have health insurance. So it is so necessary um, for people like me, people who are, you know, venturing out, starting businesses, shift gigging, who are below that threshold, who are just really trying um, to make it to the point. I would love to be in a place where I could afford private health insurance. Um, one of these days, I'm going to be, um, health insurance is, is like a rich people's thing. <laughs> so, um, but at this point, you know, just being able to have something to fall back on something to be able to take care of myself. I'm a single mom, um, you know, always make sure my kids are taken care of. It would be nice to be able to take care of myself to have some health care. Thank you for that, Nika. Health insurance should not be a rich people's thing. It should be an everybody thing. And so thank you for um, opening your heart and sharing with us and sharing your journey. Um, and um, when we pass this thing on Tuesday, uh, we will be able to shift that and change that. So thank you for that. Um, any more questions, Jennifer? Have any questions popped up? We don't have any other questions at this point. <laughs> for those well, maybe, you, yeah. maybe you just did a good job, y'all. Yay, <laughs> Lester and Shelly and Nika and Sean and Jenny. Rock, yay. <laughs> Michael has left you all because he has another Zoom. I will be going to three more Zooms after um, I leave this one. So this is my been, you know, I don't know. I'm old. So you all probably don't remember Zoom. They used to be like Sesame Street that was on um, on TV. <laughs> and so I feel like I'm Zooming um, or Aretha Franklin, Zoom, Zoom, Zooming. Um, and that's what I feel like lately. Um, but this is, it is wonderful to be able to share out the information to everyone, to all the far reaches of Missouri, to down in the boot hill, Mr. Lester, I had never been in the boot hill before um, January of 2020. And so, you know, I was stereotypical and thinking, it's no black people down in the boot hill. It's a whole oh. bunch of black people down in the boot hill. Yeah, um, been able to experience folks, you know, in Northeast and Northwest Missouri, mid Missouri, Southwest Missouri, obviously Kansas City and St. Louis. And so it's been wonderful to be able to really share out this information and help guide us around our self-interest, right? So we vote in ways that will make our lives better. Um, and so I love being on here with Alive and Well. I thank Jennifer and Abe and Sean and Von Treese and Teddy and all the other ambassadors who are working hard to make um, this happen um, along with the Alive and Well staff. So thank y'all so, so very much. We really appreciate you. Cecilia, thank you to you and Michael. Um, truly, we know how hard you're working to make this happen for all of us. Um, so I think I have one last question for you. So we're going into a weekend um, and we'll be talking to our friends and family, telling them that they need to get out and vote, um, of course, safely. Um, but they may be getting some mail that says things like, this is gonna break the state budget. What do we tell them? It's a lie. Um, it's a big fat lie. It's a myth. What we actually know is that those other 36 states that have um, expanded Medicaid and that Medicaid is up and running in their state, it's not up and running in, um, in uh, excuse me, Oklahoma yet because Oklahoma just expanded. They just voted about two and a half, three weeks ago. And so um, in those other 36 states that have expanded Medicaid, no one has said, we don't want this. We want to repeal this. Actually, what they, what they have found is there, there's been a boom to their economy in the states. There has been a boom to their health care in the states, um, upwards of about $8 billion um, in each state, at least. They have found economic um, advantages to Medicaid expanding in their state. So they have found economic advantages in rural hospitals um, remaining open, rural hospitals opening, um, extended and expanded health care in their state. So not only their rural and urban hospitals being able to remain, but also satellites. They have found that it is expanded by um, an average of 26,000 jobs per state that have, has expanded this. So that myth is going to be the one that our opposition says, you know, it's going to break us. It is not. 
Another myth that they're going to say is this takes from the education budget. That's a huge myth, y'all. No one ha puts money in um, education and then dips in that from transportation or healthcare or housing. Um, mm. That is not the case, right? And so yeah. we know that there's a 90% federal um, component to Medicaid expansion that has remained and been sustainable since 2011. And so that has not changed in any state. So we'll know that we'll get 90% from the federal government and 10% comes from our state. Um, there has actually, there people have said that this is gonna increase our taxes. What all the studies that have come out has shown that there's actually been a neutral aspect of taxes. So that means taxes don't go up or they don't go down. They remain the same. And again, it's increased the economic um, viability of our states. And so that's what we want for us. You know, we would love for those 14 rural hospitals that have closed since 2015 to be back opened um, or for something new to happen in those areas. So people don't have to drive an hour, hour and a half to get to St. Louis or Kansas City um, when they're ill. Yeah. Thank you, Cecilia. Yeah. Sean, were you going to add something? Um, uh, maybe a couple of things. And I, and I see in the chat where Sean was asking, are there other myths that need to be dispelled? I think one thing about the budget that we need to keep in mind is that oftentimes when um, people talk about Medicaid taking up so much of the state budget, mm -hmm. it's important to realize that a lot of Missouri's budget is made up of federal dollars, federal match dollars. So um, to the degree to which we have a $23 billion budget, a significant portion of that is already federal dollars. Missouri is very aggressive in, um, in, in getting uh, federal dollars, whether that's for transportation or healthcare or education. Um, and so um, the opposition to Medi Medicaid has very little to do, expanding Medicaid has very little to do with Missouri being allergic to federal dollars. Um, we love federal dollars in every other context other than this one. Another thing to keep in mind is that that 10% um, that, um, that is the state share, many other states have offset that um, by moving certain populations that are already on Medicaid into the expansion um, category. Um, and there are a variety of ways of doing this. One is through the medically frail category. There are other ways of doing that as well. Um, so there, there really, there are all the incentives within the policy that gives a state that is really committed to giving health care to their citizens of being able to reduce the state share as much as possible. Um, and so even within the range that is included in terms of uh, what people will actually see on the ballot. It says very clearly, very clearly, that Medicaid expansion will have no impact upon taxes. So the, the myths that are being um, propagated out there is really disinformation. These things about budget and things about uh, uh, another myth, uh, another disinformation piece is that, uh, and Cecilia alluded to this, that, well, you have to choose. You have to choose between um, uh, people with disabilities and the elderly who really deserve help versus able-bodied people uh, who don't really need any help. And that's a myth uh, and it's disinformation. First of all, it pits us against one another, uh, which is not something that is a natural aspect of policy. There is no reason why elderly and people with disabilities need to be cut in order to give a broader swath of people healthcare under expansion. Um, the fact of the matter is um, the supermajority in Jefferson City has been, they've been cutting education and cutting programs for people with disabilities and the elderly without there being expansion. Um, so that false choice is something that um, we'll probably be confronted with a lot over the weekend right before the vote. And the principle to keep in mind is, is that it is a false choice. Um, there are enough resources, particularly with Medicaid expansion, to make sure that no one has to go without. Uh, and if there are draconian cuts, it is because of a willful choice on, on an ideological, um, for ideological reasons, 
not for policy or fiscal responsibility reasons. One other thing that I'll add, I don't want to talk too much. One other thing that I'll add is this. Why are you giving good stuff, please? Um, is, is that um, when, we, when we think about taxes and tax structure in Missouri, first of all, the General Assembly cannot raise taxes uh, without a vote of the people. So that's one thing to bear in mind. Um, the second thing is that, for instance, we have cut taxes uh, over the last decade almost every year uh, up until this year. Um, and those tax cuts have reduced the amount of revenue, the amount of resources that we have as a state. And many times the, uh, the justification for doing so is that, well, if you have more money in people's pockets, then that rebounds to more revenue coming into the state, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is that is not true. And I would urge people to go and look on the Missouri Budget Project's website. They have a, a wealth of information um, about policy, uh, uh, budget and policy much of it in layman's language that any all of us can all understand. Um, but the bottom line is, is that the priority in Jefferson City has been cutting taxes for businesses and corporations and wealthy individuals at the expense of other citizens. And so that's the reason why we have, um, we, we are put in the position of being tempted to believe false choices. I'll give you an example. There was a bill that was passed a couple of years ago, Senate Bill 509, I believe, um, sponsored by our current Secretary of State when he was in the, um, I'm sorry, Attorney General, when he was in the General Assembly. And um, at the time, it had bipartisan support because it is, it's a tax cut bill primarily for businesses that cuts the corporate tax rate, which is already very low, to, was already too low cuts it even more. And the price tag was said to be about $15 million, which in the grand scheme of things may not seem like a lot of money. It's a lot of money to us as individuals, but as a state, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. That bill, had, uh, that particular bill, Senate Bill 509, ended up costing Missourians um, uh, over $150 million. And it sets into place a structure, and I won't get into all the details of it, that makes it more difficult if it is fully implemented for us to actually fully recover from uh, from the recession that we're heading into uh, because it sets these ceilings these artificial ceilings that make it that whenever revenue rises past a certain point then there has to be a refund given to people and as we know there are certain things that we can only do together as as a state like roads, like provide uh, health care, like provide education. Um, and so these false choices that are being presented with the rhetoric that we'll hear and disinformation, um, some of the constrictors that we have have absolutely nothing to do with Medicaid expansion or Medicaid or any safety net program. It has to do with willful choices on the part of certain policymakers who come from an ideological perspective that where they believe that the government should be in the service of industry and certain religious organizations and institutions, but not necessarily in the service of, of, of ordinary people. Um, and that's one thing that, that has to change. And it's the reason why we've had to have a budget, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a ballot initiative so that people have the opportunity to decide uh, what's best. So I'm sorry for the long winded answer, but I just wanted to put some of those things out there. I appreciate you. Thank you. We appreciate that. It puts things into context. And one of the things I, I hope that everyone caught, that Sean did not say misinformation. Sean said disinformation, which means it's purposeful, right? It's a, what, misinformation is, oh, that is a mistake. Or, you know, we didn't think about that. We would like for everyone to think about that this is intentional disinformation that we're given um, to confuse us, um, just like they do ballot language to confuse us, right, um, around these things to, so that we know that this is not something that is going to break our state's bank by any stretch of the means. Um, this is something that, for whatever reason, um, our elected officials think that they know better than we do. We've had to prove them wrong in 2018. I believe we'll prove them wrong um, on Tuesday that we know what's good for us and we will vote accordingly. 
Um, another myth is that um, Medicaid expansion is a welfare that it is for people who are just laying around that are not working and that um, don't deserve this. Again, that's a false choice because even people that might be doing that still deserve health care. I think it's a moral, it's a moral um, issue for me. And 72% of the people who will be expanded into Medicaid expansion in our state have at least one person in their family that is working full time oftentimes full times in a minimum wage job where they can't afford it, but there's at least one person working full time. So this is not for people that are not working. This is for working families. Um, another myth is that this is a black or brown issue. Actually, 73% of the people that will be able to access Medicaid expansion when it's expanded in our state are white folks. And so, these things, these stereotypical ways in which um, our opposition wants us to think that this is um, about black and brown people that are laying around and not working, that are taking advantage of the state. Lies, lies, lies. Lies that this is taking from education. Lies that this is going to um, break our state budget. Not true. Some, some other things to, to think about. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Um, first of all, um, it, 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 as, as Cecilia said, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if a person is working, um, whether or not they are eligible for a particular program. That, that should be the baseline because it's, it's a moral issue. And, and one thing that's, important to keep in mind is that the opposition always tries to use a moral argument to discount um, the need or, 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 or Medicaid expansion uh, to try to say that it essentially gives lazy people the opportunity um, to forego work as if most people don't want to work. And we already have examples, clear examples here of individuals uh, who have the initiative and the drive, like the vast majority of people, <laughs> adults, have the, the drive to want to work. The problem is not that people don't want to work. The problem is, is that work does not provide enough, much, much of the work that we have in, in this country does not provide a living wage. And most people are working a um, huge amount of hours, 40, 60 hours, and still don't have health care. Their employers don't provide health care. Um, and so that's, that's the problem. Two other points that I will make. One is that employer-sponsored insurance is tax subsidized. Let me say that again. The insurance that people get on their jobs is heavily subsidized by taxes, which means that expanding Medicaid is no different than the subsidies that employers receive uh, under certain circumstances uh, to subsidize their, pro their provision of insurance for people that work. So it's, it's, um, it's wrong to try to make it seem as if it's one or the other that we need it. It's a false choice. The last thing that I'll say has to do with the term able-bodied. Where they say, well, able-bodied people should not be eligible for uh, for any kind of assistance from, from the state. Um, so the fact of the matter is, one, there is no legal definition in statute, either at the federal or the state level, um, that defines what an able-bodied person is. Um, second, the fact of the matter is work has changed. Maybe about 40 years ago or so, somebody with a strong back, a good work ethic, and common sense could go out and dig ditches and provide for their family and have health care coverage, perhaps. But we don't live in that kind of economy anymore. And so a person can be able-bodied or not and be working as people are already in this circumstance, 40, 60, 80 hours, and still not have health care. Not because they're lazy, not because they're not working, but because they are not provided that benefit by their employers. 
The fact of the matter is there are billion dollar corporations that have obscene levels of profit who the majority or a good portion of their workers qualify for both Medicaid and SNAP um, and, 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 or other forms of safety net um, uh, assistance. And that should not be, that should not be. They should be providing their workers with healthcare, but their workers are being subsidized by our tax dollars. And that's not really talked about very much. Not saying that's wrong, it's not their fault. But the fact of the matter is we don't have an equitable system and Medicaid expansion uh, is designed to try to make things a little bit more just. Um, and one other point that I'll make about the able-bodied canard is the fact that um, many people that are on Medicaid who have disabilities, however, whether they are invisible disabilities or visible disabilities, they work. And the vast majority of the people that have disabilities, they would love to work, but the system is constrained by administrative burdens that makes it very difficult for people, whether they, whether they have disabilities or not, to be able to be gainfully employed and still have the access that they need to health care. Um, there are many aspects of Medicaid uh, home and community-based services that simply are not available in the private market uh, unless you are extravagantly wealthy. And so that access that's provided through Medicaid for uh, workers with disabilities is absolutely crucial. And Medicaid expansion helps to stabilize the program uh, for everybody. So those are just some points I want to add. Uh, oh, one last thing, one last thing. Uh, when we talk about welfare, um, always keep in mind the state motto. The state motto is let the welfare of the people be the supreme law. Um, and so uh, welfare is good. Um, and it need not be morally bludgeoned by people who are hypocritical and interest that are hypocritical. Um, Sean gave us a word today. Sean gave us a bunch of words today. So thank you, Sean. I really do appreciate that. Um, I think that it's important that we tell the truth. And I think it's important that we tell the truth that our opponents will use a moral issue to do very unmoral things to the people of the state. They'll use a moral issue like welfare or a moral issue like people are lazy or whatever they lie, lie they come up with um, to do drastically unmoral things by putting profit over people. And so um, let us dispel all of those rumors and that disinformation and the misinformation that happens. And let us utilize all of our collective power, collective um, irritation and rage and collective voice by voting yes on two on Tuesday. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate being here. Um, I wish I could stay on longer. Um, if you all have more things, Sean can answer anything that's right there. I can tell, um, but I have to hop on for a, a seven o'clock. Um, and I look keep forward on, keep to on, Cecilia. I will. I will. Thank you, Thank you all everybody. so much. Bye. Bye. So we will um, conclude um, for the evening. Just thank our panelists so much for being with us tonight. Sean, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Shelly, for sharing your story and your children. We love seeing um, their faces as well. Um, so it's great to have you on Shelly Lester. Always good to have you. I know you're out there helping the kids at Fountain Center in Charleston, Missouri. So thank you. Jenny, thank you for bringing the story around substance use to the table. And Nika, always good to see you. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And congrats on soul centricity. We can't wait to see that take off in Kansas City. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Congrats. Thank you. So, I, um, today, I know um, John Lewis's funeral took place. And there's a quote that I saw um, from him today that really struck with me in this conversation. So I'm just gonna conclude with that, that democracy is not a state, it's an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. And I think voting yes on two is a great way to live out his values um, and vision for our country. So with that, we'll say good night.
vote yes on two, um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. I'm getting me.